make sure that nobody decides to go into political soliloquy. We've got Ms. Ashley Green. And our straw poll volunteers who will find out just how much these people had an influence on you and your vote taking after this. Uh, it's Aaron Dietrich and Michelle Kerr. And lastly, let's give a round of applause to our event maestro, Ms. Adrian Redman. Something very critical that we'd like to discuss. We could have Ms. Robin Wynn come on up. Um, well, Robin's not here, so let us have. Oh, she's coming. She's coming. While she's walking on up, uh, our pastor, the man who pays the bills, would like to have a few words with you, so we will give him our undivided attention for just a moment. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Candidates, mayor. All of you have been grateful to have you here. We're glad that you all have joined the food. I'm going to go back and finish what I started. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But I'm grateful to have you here tonight. I want to say this for the onset. This is a very important time for you to hear from the candidates and ask questions of the purpose of the community. With that being said, I'm going to ask the person here that came loaded, both barrels, because you got to keep a little thing. Say that till another time. We want to keep this brisk, upbeat, positive, and factual. Because at the end of the day, it's not about emotions, it's about progress. Amen? Amen. Yeah. 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 I want to thank Gypsy and everybody who has written this a good job, SEIU. And to our kitchen staff, thank you all for making this wonderful meal for us. I can go and thank the cook, amen? Yeah. Chinese proverb, never piss off the person who's pouring your Kool Aid. <laughs> anyway, thank you all. Enjoy the dessert. Words of wisdom from a wise man. Now, I know that everybody has beautiful, high-tech, very expensive cell phones. Now what do you need to do is shut them off. Shut them off, please. It's worse than it's going to be there, okay? Cut all of that off. We don't want to hear all the songs on your ringtone. All right, we want to be able to keep things going so everybody touches the cell phones all the way off so we don't have to be disturbed. <laughs> keep things going. The last thing you want is you have something very important to say. And a bad song comes on and everybody is totally distracted by the music and not what you say. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before we begin again, we'd like to introduce our moderator, one of the key people that are going to be involved in a lot of business person. And there was the phone. Well, I know. See, that one phone, let that be the best. The next person you want to have to ask you to hold your call. All right, go ahead, Robin. Good evening. My name is Robin Wynn. I'm here on the behalf of SEIU, Public, Public, Florida Public Service Union. The best way to introduce our purpose tonight is to look around you. Everyone take a moment to scan the room and think about what you see. What you see is people from pastors, fraternity and sorority leaders, civil rights activists, working people of the city. This is South St. Petersburg. And what you will hear tonight are questions about everything from crime to youth jobs, economic development, neighborhood issues, and more. But one thing they all have in common is what you see, a more prosperous community and city. In the months and years to come, you will see more of this type of unity and collaboration SEIU is solidly behind a new 2020 plan, working hand in hand with the People's Budget Review, to move St. Petersburg forward. That's why we are organizing hundreds and thousands of residents to speak up for investment in jobs and health of our neighborhood and first public hearing in September the 12th at St. Petersburg City Hall. Please check out the flyer right here, the 2020 plan, 
Make sure you tell your friends and neighbors about this important hearing. After all, this is our city. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm moderated for the evening has been visible in Pinellas County for many years, attending Pinellas County schools and graduating from the historically black college known around here as the magnificent for agricultural yes. university. Here, here. Yes. <laughs> and serving now for Kappa Alpha is Morgan Incorporated. She has led several charges from youth sports to youth employment. This mother of three, wife, lover, and partner of Daniel, and a servant to many who believe that it's not just about being right, about doing right. Ladies and gentlemen, I will now relinquish this mic to the Power Broker Foundation's chair, YMCA, I pray St. Petersburg, Child Park, Ranch, is that the must do before I move any further, and that's acknowledging all of the forum sponsors and co-sponsors. So please bear with me. The Agenda 2010, NAACP, SEIU, FPSU, Bethel Community Foundation, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority, Omega Psi Phi Fraternity, Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity, Center for Community and Economic Justice, Project Jafur, Mothers of Civilization, Council of Neighborhood Associations, Pinellas County Urban League, National Council of Negro Women Metropolitan Chapter, the Carter G. Woodson African American Museum, Sojourner Truth Center, Community Housing Solutions, <coughs> Urban Development Solutions, BlackInTheBay.com, Bounce TV, The Deuces Live, Mothers of Civilization, WRSB AM 1590, and The Power Broker Magazine. Thank you. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask Ms. Robin Wynn, she's already brought the purpose, but we are going to officially have the welcome and the explanation overview of Agenda 2020. Ms. Gwynn, Those of you who work in the community know that you're always working in the community, and sometimes when you come to a meeting, you don't even know that you're going to be working until you get here, and then they tell you what you're supposed to do. And that's what happened to me tonight. But it is indeed my pleasure to welcome you here and to look out at this uh, diverse audience and feel very good about our community and our community's investment in our future. And your, your presence here tonight is evidence of that. I will not insult you by telling you about Agenda 2010, but we've done such a wonderful job of putting a two-pager together to tell you about um, Southside 2020. What I do want to point out to you is the little blue box on the back of the sheet that says, learn more and get involved. At this point, you don't have to know everything you need to know to consider getting involved, you will find on these two pages. What I'd like to do is tell you how important it is for you to get involved. This plan is your plan. This plan is our plan. And it cannot be our plan unless we all work on it together. So there's an uh, email address, there's a telephone number, there's a website. Check it out. There are 10 areas that we need your expertise and your work groups will begin meeting. Think about it. Pick one. <coughs> Come out and help us develop that part of the plan. I know this is going to be an exciting evening. I know we're going to have some deep, well thought out questions, provoking questions that will help us either reaffirm the person we've already chosen or change our mind and choose someone else. So let's get started.
once again, um, I want to thank Pastor Sykes and um, acknowledge him for his contributions. Um, again, we want to acknowledge the fact that um, we are here in the sponsoring organizations, and again, with your cell phones, we can't stress that to please turn them off at this time. At this time, would our rules keeper, Mr. Christian Haas, please come forward. Good evening, everybody. My name is Christian Haas, and uh, I work at USF St. Pete, and I, I'm involved with the People's Budget Review and, and Awake at Pinellas. Um, not to belabor the point, please turn your phones off. Unless you're part of my generation, you want to post it on Facebook, and you can take a picture silently. I'm okay with that. Um, but some of, the, some of the real rules, the audience members are going to have 90 seconds or a minute and a half to ask your questions. It's really important that you think through what you're going to ask so you don't find yourself rambling at the mic. Um, there is a bit of a difference between a statement or a comment and a question, so keep that in mind when you're, when you're coming up to the mic. Uh, the questions may be directed at one or all of the candidates. If they're directed at one candidate, the candidate will have two minutes to answer. If they're directed at all the candidates, the candidate will have 90 seconds to answer. If you approach your time limit, you'll see a warning sign. And if uh, you reach a time limit, you're going to see a stop sign. And if you keep speaking at the stop sign, we'll have to escort you out. <laughs> now, now, now we're good. But I think most importantly, be respectful of everybody, of the people asking the questions, of the answers given. Um, even if you don't agree, uh, dialogue is the most important part of democracy. And we can't have constructive dialogue if we're being disrespectful. So keep that in mind when you, uh, when you take the mic. Thank you. At this time, we are going to ask each candidate, would you please introduce yourself, and we're going to start with ladies first. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to all the sponsors. Hi, I'm Kathleen Ford, and as many of you all know, I was a critical care nurse, and then I went on to law school. I've always cared about people, and I care about the conditions from which people come and to which Return and, and that's actually how I got involved both in Houston, Texas, where I worked as a critical care nurse. And then when I moved back, married to my native husband, Harvey Ford, here in St. Petersburg. I became involved in volunteering in the city of St. Petersburg with our neighborhood and trying to turn it around. There was problems with drug dealing, code enforcement problems. So as a part of my volunteering getting back, we developed the very first neighborhood plan. And then from there, City officials asked me to help Bartlett Park develop their first neighborhood plan. And then I sat on the city's affordable housing round table and I participated in the SHIP, the, that's the State Housing Initiatives program where we decide what, where the job stamp funds will go for affordable housing. And I participated in St. Pete Crowd and a lot of these programs. And then from there, I was asked to run for City Council and I had the pleasure and privilege of serving as a council member for four years. As many of you know, I am very much concerned about how the city of St. Pete spends money and that our budget reflects our values. And thus, I work very hard with the group to make sure that we could get a vote on how our money is being spent. First, on the waterfront stadium. I don't know if any of you all remember that. I love baseball, but I was concerned about that. And then, most recently, I've been working with folks because there were so many folks who did not like the fact that they were closed out of the process for deciding on how the money would be spent on our downtown waterfront. That vote will be coming up at the end of August. That's uh, $2.8 million that's already been spent on a plan that may not be approved. And just think where that money could have been spent. And have you all heard me speak in the past about my concern about the growing fund balances in our city budget. And in fact, many of you from SEIU will probably remember when I came down to speak against Mayor Baker, who wanted to declare an emergency and not honor the, the union contracts that were in place, stating that there was a budget crisis. And I pointed out at the hearing that there was no emergency. We had plenty of money in those fund balances to pay folks what they deserve. And you all know that's how I feel about that. I would look forward to the opportunity to serve you, and I look forward to the conversation we're going to have tonight. That's Kathleen Ford. 
<clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh, many of you know me from the six years that I served on St. Pete City Council, serving as chair in 2005. Uh, after that, I served in the State House uh, as, a, uh, as a representative for six years uh, before coming back here to St. Pete. But for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rick Reisman. Uh, I've been married to my wife, Carrie, for 20 years. We have two kids. My daughter is 15, Jordan, and my son, Samuel, is uh, 10 years old. Uh, I decided not to run for re-election to the House uh, because Tallahassee is a place where ideas and common sense doesn't seem to matter anymore. And I wanted to come back to a place where people and policy really matters. And, and that's what local government's really about. And that's what St. Petersburg is really about. Uh, it's about people and policy, and it's not about partisanship. I had the honor of serving for six years with Rick Baker when he was mayor. Rick's a Republican. I'm a Democrat. Uh, you know, but we, we both love the city, and we never let our differences get in the way of moving the city forward, because that's really what it's all about. It's, it's moving the city forward, and it's about taking on the big issues that we have that are facing us, but also paying attention to all the other issues that make cities great. Issues like strong public education, vibrant neighborhoods, and uh, quality, high-paying jobs. Those are the things that make cities great. That's what St. Petersburg uh, has made St. Pete great for so long, but it's what can make us even better when we refocus our energies on bringing back our neighborhoods, which once were very vibrant. Um, I look forward to the opportunity to answer your questions tonight. We have a lot of issues that are facing us, and it's time that we came together to face these issues because as a community we can accomplish more than we can as individuals when we're working together, when we're unified, and when your leadership is actually leading, taking solid positions, and is willing to listen, to learn, and then to lead. Then we can become the city that, that we know we all can become. So I look forward to your, to your questions tonight. Thank you all for being here and thank you to all the sponsors. Well, good evening. My name is Bill Foster, and I am the mayor of St. Petersburg. And now this is on. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for spending this moment with us. And thank you to all of the sponsors that, that are putting this program on, and really to, for allowing a format with a 90-second <coughs> question. Because you can make a statement, and as long as you put a little question mark at the end, we all get to hear from you. And these are opportunities that we can't pass up. You know, as I said, I am the mayor of St. Petersburg, and it's not a geographical area. It's, it's, it's the mayor of North, South, North St. Petersburg, West, South. I'm the mayor of South St. Petersburg. And I know that this is a, a format that uh, is, is going to discuss issues in South St. Petersburg, but let's talk about the City United. Let's talk about what our commonality and how great the city is doing, not everywhere, but what our visions are going forward. My vision four years ago, anticipating the greatest recession of our, of our lifetime, anticipating a mortgage foreclosure crisis that, was a, a, that, that really packed the punch, was to create environments that were conducive for, for private investment, to really work on the details, to worry about look, smell, and feel. Yes, customer service, housing stock, and all of these things, incentives to do business in the city. We're on track for almost a half a billion dollars in new growth. This is properties that will be on the tax rolls next year. It's to focus on our employees, and I'm glad that Robin is here representing the SEIU, and she knows all about my open door policy, but knowing that happy employees make happy customers, happy customers make happy citizens. Knowing who you work for, I work for you. Now for the past three and a half years, you have signed my paycheck. And I have been in the community, but my service didn't start in 2000, and, or in 19, and when was I elected? 2010. It started in 1998 when I, start, when I started on the city council. And my passion for South St. Petersburg, as it was for all the city, was to make it better. And it didn't just start with the community law fest, it was to, it was to support the initiatives of Job Corps and, and, the, um, and the, the redevelopment of the TACRA site, the Tangerine Redevelopment. 
the Mercy Hospital, the Midtown Post Office. All of these things go back to a previous administration, but when you're on the city council working together, you vote on these things. And as you go forward, it is making sure that we're work working on economic development, public safety, that we have an African American Heritage Trail, that we build a St. Petersburg College Midtown campus, 45,000 square feet. And we continue to work on initiatives that are important to you to bring in private investment. It has been the greatest honor of my life to serve you for the past four years. And I'm asking that you re-up me and let's do it again. Let's continue to run out. Thank you. Thank you. I want to call our strong, stronghold leader, Aaron Dietrich, Mr. Dietrich, and Ms. Michelle Kerr to come up and explain their role and provide our first stronghold result. You're starting to stronghold up? Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Aaron Dietrich, and I've been charged with uh, handling the straw poll process, which will be pretty interesting this evening. You should all see your, uh, your little ballot here, a little uh, small little square. This is how we're going to kind of gauge your, uh, your hearts and minds based on the discussions you hear here this evening. So uh, we are going to have some results based on what we hear tonight. Uh, what we're going to ask you to do when the time comes is to please fill this out. We're going to set up a box right outside the door. If you could please fold it in half and be ready to just drop it in there as you're leaving. Um, the results will not be ready by this evening, I don't believe, but we will send <coughs> them out to you uh, as soon as we possibly can. Okay? All right. All right. Thank you. Now, this is where we're actually going to get started with questions. And I have the honor of actually asking the first question. And I'm going to ask this question of all three candidates. And um, please be as clear and as honest as you can. Let's start with a simple question. If you are elected as mayor, what is the first financial investment you will make in order to improve life in South St. Petersburg? All right. It's got to be in housing. I keep turning this off. It'll be in housing. And as we look, as I took my team through the Midtown area and as we explored all of the issues around Melrose Elementary, it became very clear that we needed to make sure that we worked on all of these things as these these conditions as kids are walking to school, ingress and egress, some of the blight and some of the things that, that they had to pass through. You know, I've read this, this study on poverty and I've, I've, I've gotten to understand what this, study, what this study means and some of the erosion. When I think about poverty, I think about a sinkhole. And we talk about sinkholes a lot, but it's, you've got to stop the erosion. And it's the erosion of the family, it's the erosion of economic opportunities, it's the erosion in education. It's all of these things, but it's, it's stemming from people having an affordable house where they can live, where they can raise their family. And you start to work on that environment. So we, we, we went to Melrose and we looked at how are we going to invest in the Melrose area, that community, and remove blight and use NSP money and go after neighborhood stabilization initiatives and project rebuilds and all of these monies that are available and how are we going to invest in this area to, re to have that ripple effect. So it's going to be housing and blight removal and we're going to start it in that radius around Melrose Elementary. It's a plan that's already in place. So to answer this question, I kind of have to get a little technical. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. Because one of the first things that you do as mayor is you put your administration together. And if I'm going to put my administration together, one of the positions that is going to be mandatory in my administration is to have somebody whose sole focus is on Midtown and South St. Petersburg. Now, I've said before, I will never criticize the decision of the existing mayor to hire or fire anyone. But I will take issue with the fact that when someone was fired, they weren't replaced. 
And that was a position that was to be the liaison, the economic driver in the administration <coughs> that was paying attention to Midtown. <coughs> so technically, my first answer would be to make sure I have somebody in place to do that. But where I want to see us focus our money on right away is on looking at summer jobs for kids. We have got to increase the funding for summer jobs for kids. If we are going to give kids hope, if we are going to give them an opportunity to grow and to move, they've got to start building that experience. They've got to start learning how to deal with making money, how to save money, and how to spend it wisely. And we've got to give them a future. Uh, so that's one of the first areas I want to focus my, 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 my uh, where we put our resources in, is creating and enhancing summer job programs. Great question. And after I put together my administrative team, my focus will be looking at preschools. I think that education is the key to economic self sufficiency. And I just think it's terrible that $2.4 million was returned that could have been used to help our community. And we know that if we reach children early and prepare them so that they're ready for school, they have a greater chance of success. And we know about the third grade reading statistics and we know what sort of future that can portend if children aren't successful. It's time to stop that prison pipeline. So I'm committed to making that change as soon as I am elected because I think it is really, really important that we offer a brighter future for our children. And it's been interesting to me to learn that our largest employer, private employer in the Midtown area, according to Maria Scruggs, is our child care center. There are so many folks who are already employed and taking care of our children. So I want to look to see what we can do to grow that, in addition to see how we can use our existing governmental resources to expand that, because education is the key, and that's where we are slipping. You know? Although our job is to run the city, we do know that education is going to be a key component of economic su success. Thank you. Okay, you warmed up? Ready to go? Go, go. All right. I have another, just one more question. I'm going to take the uh, ask yeah. a follow up question then, though, to something. Real quick. Real quick. Well, you know what? Go ahead. Go ahead and ask me what's good. Mine is some questions. Hi, I'm Teresa Jones. This question is actually directed to uh, this board. Uh, you just made a comment related to 2.4 million dollars to the state. Can you clarify, was that funds, those funds returned by the city or some other organization? Well, that was returned by the county and actually early learning child care program. There was a nonprofit, right, that was set up to make applications for those dollars and they didn't get in enough applications. So that's a great clarification, Teresa, because it is important. It wasn't anything our city didn't do. It wasn't anything that our county didn't do it. it was the agency that had the contract with the county in order to provide that care and that's where I would have thought we would have had some of our elected officials really being vocal about that and some of them are because I think we all realize that there's a real need to make sure that we get all of those dollars that our community deserves. Thank you. That was one of the Next. According to our Southside photo guide, and hopefully everyone has a copy. Money is one of the most important issues in this mayoral race. You've all seen the Pinellas County report that says that poverty is costing Pinellas County taxpayers $2.3 billion per year. And that the biggest concentration of poverty is right here in South St. Petersburg. Now, you were asked by Agenda 2010 and the NAACP whether you would be willing to invest some of the city's excess savings into job-creating initiatives to help reduce poverty in our community. Would you please share your answer to that question with the audience here tonight as a yes or no with your explanation as to why? I'll go first on that one, and my answer is yes. 
Um, we've got to start investing and we have to create jobs. I mean, one of the things that, uh, that, that I saw happen in Tallahassee, the same thing happens here, is we spend money on things that cost so much more, like incarcerating people, than it does in providing education, substance abuse, rehab programs, mental health counseling. It's so much cheaper to invest the money on the front end than it is to spend it on the back end. And when we have excess dollars, to not take those monies and invest them into the community makes no sense. So to me, that's an easy one, and it's a yes. As many of you all know, I am one who's identified all those large fund balances. And it's interesting how the fund balances have changed names over the years. And there are significant fund balances still available. And yes, I am committed to using those funds in order to develop our community and move us forward. I think it's, again, such a shame that $3.8 million was spent on the lens proposal in light of all the opposition to that. Just think that $3.8 million could have been spent in our community. And I think that's the difference between me and the others is that I'm willing to take a stand and I'm willing to point out, hey, let's pause, let's take our time, let's get it right. Well, the beauty of being, oh, i got to keep this on, the beauty of being your mayor for the past three and a half years, <laughs> you hired me to be a steward of your money. It's not my money, it's your money. If it were my money, I could say yes. We'll spend our savings account on all of these things and make promises that ultimately you should, you should know that we can't keep, but it's your money. And the word excess would lead you to believe that we have an excess. We have reserves. Whether it's economic stability, general fund, we have reserves, and it was the city council that placed targets for a percentage of general funds that place targets for these reserves. And on these funds, we don't have any excess. If a natural disaster came through, and we know what has happened with FEMA, and we know we can't rely upon the federal government or the state government, we have to be able to provide for ourselves if a catastrophic event comes through, we've got, to, we've got to be able to take care of our own. So that's what these reserves are all about. Now, in sanitation, we have the healthy fund balance. But you know what? We're going to take that fund balance and we're going to, we're going to buy a new sanitation fleet using compressed natural gas. It's better for the environment, lower maintenance, better mileage. It's all good. So where we have fund balance, we're going to use these funds accordingly. Same thing in equipment replacement. But to, to give an inference that we have excess, we don't. Now, will we use Project Rebuild? Will we use CB, CDBG, Penny for Pinellas, NSP, all of these alphabet soup acronyms that you're all accustomed to? Absolutely, we will invest in this community. Thank you. Now, this is the part of the program where you actually are able to ask your own questions. And again, as we politically and as, as delicately as we tried to state in the beginning, again, there's a difference between a statement and a question. And if you have your barrels loaded, well, I said to put it away and just, you know, get to be done. And just, you know, ask your question of the candidates. Please state your question, state your name, your organization. And if you have a question for all three candidates or for one specific candidate. Thank you. Ray Tampa speaking as an individual. And I put my gun away and I do have a BB gun. <laughs> and then this question is for all the individual uh, candidates. Poverty pimps is a derogatory term or label used to convey that an individual or group is benefiting unduly by acting as an intermediary on behalf of the poor, the disadvantaged, or some other victimized groups. Are you 
as candidates for mayor willing to recognize and reject the poverty pimps in our community? The answer is, the answer is undoubtedly yes. I haven't heard that term, and, and uh, the answer is yes. And uh, I want to thank Mr. Tampa for his commitment to education over these years and his commitment to the NAACP. Uh, I hear you, and uh, I absolutely will reject that. Thank you for your service. And I too have not heard that. But uh, I certainly would reject it. Uh, anyone who's praying on those who are in need, uh, those who are uh, most susceptible in our community, uh, is a mess, is fickle, and certainly it's something that I, I have no time for. Mr. Tampa, I too recognize and will reject poverty. And so let me just go a little bit further to say that I think that's what's really important, that we have some accountability for all of our programs. And whether it's for economic development on one area of town or another area of town, I think it's very important that when we're giving incentives or we're putting somebody in charge of a program, that we make sure that the city is getting what it bargained for. And I'm concerned when I look at some of our other private contracts as to how these things are changing and who now has control over significant city assets. And I think it is very important that we stay on top of it and that as your mayor, I would demand accountability for anybody who was receiving any city funds whatsoever. Those dollars are precious. I know that you work very hard to earn your money and when you're taxed and asked to pay for services, which you don't mind. We are in the civil society. You know that's the price of a civilized society. But you want to make sure those dollars are spent wisely and that what was promised is produced. And I'm there. I will be there to make sure that happens. Thanks. Hi. My name is Del Thompson, and I'm a lifetime resident of St. Petersburg, and I've pretty much lived all over the city. This question is for you, Mayor Foster. Can you possibly explain your seamless city mission submission statement that you had, and how have you applied it over your term to the south side and particularly the Midtown area? That's a great question. And when I think of Seamless City, when I, and, and let me explain this. I was talking to a group of fourth graders, and it was at a Catholic school on the north side of St. Pete. Well, this is how I define a Seamless City. And I asked him, I said, and this was a couple years ago, and I said, is there an area of St. Petersburg? Now, these are fourth graders. They don't read the paper. They don't watch the news. They're influenced by teachers, by coaches, by parents, by church members. But I said, is there anywhere in St. Petersburg that you feel is unsafe, where you would not like to go? And I asked them to raise their hands. And guess what? Every single one of those little darlings raised their hands. And I said, I commit to you, and I'll come back four years from now. And I want and I want to make sure that the answer is different, that we work on those things that are perception related or related, but it's about public safety. It's about, about making sure that we have safe environments throughout the city. It's making sure that we have businesses that want to grow. It's making sure that we have affordable housing stock, that we've removed the blight, that we've given people opportunities. And it's all about opportunity. So seamless city to me is that there's no imaginary line in the road and that you feel very comfortable regardless of where you are in the city and that you feel comfortable and that you feel that the opportunities are there. And so we've been working on that, yes. No excuses. This recession has kicked our backsides. And with this mortgage foreclosure crisis, it made it just as bad. But guess what? We have sowed these seeds throughout the entire community, and the harvest is there. That's why I'm running for mayor again, because things are starting to take root. We've got passionate people working on plans. This will work. Before we ask our next question, 
Um, we would like to acknowledge those that have walked into the room. Councilman Wayne Davis, we would like to acknowledge his presence here today. As well as State Representative Dow Rusan, who I saw at the back. This is for all of you, and I've been following you around on the campaign trail, it seems. And you all have talked about education. And let me first direct this um, to Ms. Ford and then to the others. Um, you made a comment recently about prisons can predict how many cells to build with how many kids cannot make it through third grade. And you can clarify that, but let me just say, you walk through some of the South Side schools, Maximo, Fairmont, Melrose, all the ones that you've talked about, those kids aren't making it. They're not coming to school ready to learn. They're not getting on reading level by third grade. Give me something new. I know we got Summer Bridge. I know we got St. Pete Promise. I don't know. I have hopes for those, but give me something new. Well, Jim, I do share your concern. That's what I've observed. And I have two kids who graduated from college and just graduated from law school. And when I took, when we made a big chart, where are kids going to school? And we toured all the schools in St. Pete. And had, well, does this school have, EE e. was important. My child had a lot of energy. And I knew he was going to be in time out if he didn't have EE. E. Well, and many of you all know we didn't have our free play. We don't, don't have free play in school. I think that's a darn shame because I know, at least with my son, he needed to have that pen to go play. At least that scheme, many of down and study when it came time. I think that's part of the problem we have in the structure of the school day. But I see a bigger problem, and that is with the readiness to learn. And that's why I'm advocating for preschool intervention. We've got to make sure our children are ready to learn. And so many of our kids, when they get to kindergarten, are not even ready for identifying colors, letters, all that. And so they're already behind. And you know, kids are smart. They know when Johnny or Susie sitting next door knows something that they don't. And I don't want any child to feel like they're being left out. So I think we can help fill that gap to get kids ready so that they have more success in those lower grades. And we've got to work with our school system. We all know that we're not going to be the school board, but we've got to work closely. But the city can, can have a difference because we can look at the preschool part of it, get these, help get these kids ready. Thank you, Jim, for the question. Before I answer that, I did want to, since I didn't get to respond at all to Mayor Foster's, Mr. Foster's comments, it's hard to have a seamless city when you're not investing equally in all areas of the community. Amen. Um, as to the answer to your question, you know, the big thing that we need to deal with is the environment in the classroom. And all you have to do is look at fundamental schools, and you see those schools are doing well because of the environment that teachers are allowed to teach them. And one of the ways you can change the environment in the classroom is through something called service learning. Service learning takes community service and it integrates it into the curriculum. And there are other states that have made it mandatory that, that their, school, their schools do service learning. And what you see when kids are doing service learning and doing community service is, first off, they realize that something they do can have an impact on someone other than themselves. And that's powerful. It makes them excited about school. And when they're excited about school, they want to come to school. And when they want to come to school and they're excited about school, their grades go up, behavioral problems go down, and graduation rates go up. And they make a difference in their community, and they make a difference in their classroom. It completely changes the environment. I want to see service learning in every school in St. Petersburg, starting in elementary school. It is never too early for our kids to learn what it is to give back to their community all the way through high school. Jim, the achievement gap begins at birth. So when you think about the importance of early childhood education, early learning, it really is in the not only pre-K, but it's even earlier than that. And we have to focus on truly that early childhood education and that summer bridge is new. And I believe it will work because in partnerships with the school board, with JWB, with the city of St. Petersburg, we're implementing these summer programs called 
disguised learning. So kids can get all their, their arts and crafts and they can do all of their fun stuff in the summer, but they're learning and they're reading. And we've given them incentives to read. We have read direct, but all of these things are to make sure that we bridge so there's no slip between age two to three, three to four in, in those summer times. And something else that's new is Dr. Michael Grego. I've been mayor for three and a half years. I've had three superintendents. I think we got a good one now, though. Trust this man. He is passionate about the education of our children. Something else that's new, Renee Flowers. And she is a she is also passionate about your kids on the school board. So with this new partnership, St. Pete's Province, we finally have an Education Foundation member and or employee, a school member employee, and a city employee working together to make education better in St. Pete.
and say, absolutely, I'm giving a million dollars. But I happen to know that with that million dollars comes cuts somewhere. Is it police, fire, parks and recreation? Is it libraries? Is it, where does it come from? I spend all year long tediously going over line by line in the budget, assessing need versus want, and then thank goodness with my budget summits, kind of grew the people's budget review because it's your money. And so you're able to tell us what you want. But I wasn't there when that money was cut. But the first budget I met that I, I proposed to the city council had $250,000 back in the budget, and we've made sure that that money was in the budget every subsequent year. And this city spends more than a million dollars in its parks and recreation budget, making sure that we employ our own kids throughout the summertime, even as part-time rec workers, making sure that they have employment. And so that's a commitment from me that will continue but to do a, a million on top of the the resources that we're already providing, we can't do that. September 2007, you were on council, sir. Thank you for the question, Councilman. I was not on council at that time. Um, and it's pretty hard to believe that happened. Um, you know, I, I stated, I think it was the first question we were asked, that, that I have a commitment to summer jobs and increasing it. Uh, and it would be my commitment to do everything I can within my power to find the revenues uh, that we would need to fund the, the million dollars. And that's one of the things that, that's kind of been a little disappointing, uh, is that when you look back over uh, the, the last two administrations, the one thing that Mayor Baker always seemed to be able to do was to find revenues, whether he found them in Tallahassee, he found them in Washington, or he found them from public-private partnerships. Uh, when there was something that needed to be done that was a priority, uh, and that's what a budget is. It's a priority. It sets your values and beliefs and what you stand for as a community. You find the money. Uh, and certainly, as we've talked about, the cost of policing, the cost of incarceration is significantly more than it is in investing in jobs for our kids. And that's what we need to be investing in. As a, a quick reminder, I'm going to give some time limit rules again, if you all don't mind. If you have a question and it is directed to one candidate, you get two minutes to answer. If you have a question and it is directed to all three candidates, they have 90 seconds to answer. Your questions is a maximum of 90 seconds to state your question. When you approach your time limit, you will see this warning sign. When you reach your time limit, you will see this stop sign. Thank you. Next question. Good evening. My name is Kurt Conley. I'm here speaking as a private citizen. Uh, I live on Central Avenue, the border between the north and south sides of St. Pete. I know nobody wants to talk about this. Our newspapers won't write about it. And TV news will talk about anything but it. But anyone who's studied this, and certainly the folks who've been on the business end of it, know that the, the primary reason for the socioeconomic, the growing socioeconomic gap between the blacks and whites in this city and most cities around here is government-sponsored institutional racism. What I'd like all three candidates to answer is their understanding of what institutional racism does to St. Petersburg and what they're willing to do about it. Great.
between the rich and the poor. And that is a problem that we're seeing. Government is one way that we have been able to offer folks still a good paying job with benefits. And we have seen where there are still differences in who has what jobs where in our municipal government. It's better than others, but we know from certain instances that how employees are treated within the city is different. For example, when statements are taken from police officers, are they sworn in or not during the investigation? And we know that, for example, white officers did not have to be sworn in, but black officers did. That's institutional racism, and that has to stop. Top question. Uh, to me, institutional racism is uh, discrimination regarding housing and the ability to get affordable housing. Institutional racism is uh, city spending more of its money in the Northeast and in downtown than in other areas of the city. Uh, institutional racism is in uh, black youths being arrested at five to one for uh, small possession of small amounts of marijuana compared to white youths. That type of thing, and, and being saddled with a record uh, and a misdemeanor that makes it difficult to get jobs, that makes it difficult to get into college, uh, when other op op options are available like civil citations. That's institutional racism, uh, and it's deep-seated. And, and you talk about Central Avenue. Uh, I've talked about this previously. Uh, Central Avenue is like the, the, the Great Wall of China. It's this border that if you live to the north, you don't cross. And if we don't ever change that perception, nothing is going to change in this community. We have to start breaking down these barriers. If we're going to really have a, a city that's equal, where everyone has the same uh, options to get jobs, the same opportunities to get jobs, to get places that they can afford to live, that they can raise their family in safety. Uh, that's a solution. Thank you. Thank you. I've demonstrated that I have zero, zero tolerance for discrimination, whether it's in our employee handling of situations or any other employee situations or housing, discrimination based upon race, sexual orientation, national origin, religion, creed, zero tolerance. Now I understand the basis of institutional racism. I don't subscribe to much of what is in the book you gave me as far as the new Jim Crow laws. Because when it comes to the enforcement of laws, there's a victim somewhere the police are called, and there's a victim. There's a complainant. And then it's it's not up to the police officer, it's not up to this, this mayor to pick and choose which laws we're going to enforce. There's really not much gray area. Now, if there's a way to negotiate it away, if there's a, if there's a way to talk to the complainant and say, well, it wasn't really this or that. But that's up to the justice system, the criminal justice system, to handle and a lot of times with first-time offenders, there's, there's the pretrial interventions, there's the plans and things like that. But we still must demonstrate, you know what? There are consequences for making bad choices. And if we can catch it early, we can do something about it. But there's still a victim at the end of the day. The old, I, I am uh, Dr. Yvonne Strauss-Lovich, and I'm president of the Center for Community and Economic Justice located on Central Avenue and in South St. Pete. The old challenge to what to do about the discrepancies, poverty and race in urban areas has always been answered by housing, schools, and jobs. Last time I looked, the mayor doesn't run the school district. And while these discussions about the school district are useful, what I want to know from the mayoral candidates is what will be your strategy to collaborate in ways that you can produce money, concrete funds, to implement the 2020 plan, which has already analyzed all this stuff and has a design for 
having South St. Petersburg change its status in relation to all the other communities in St. Petersburg, and everybody wins because it eliminates by 30% the cost of supporting poverty in South St. Petersburg. And that's a great point. And it's, it's all about relationships and partnerships. Now, Mr. Price, we talked about, you know, a previous administration that could go out and find money. And, and I agree, we could find money. The feds had it. The state had it. We had it. Everybody had it. But guess what? You read the papers. You watch the news. You know that that money dried up. There's this thing out there even now called sequestration, where even the government was going to shut down. And they, they started defining employees by non-essential. So yeah, things are tight. But guess what? We have walked through the valley of the shadow together and we've come out the other end and we've got mortgage foreclosure monies because Van Bondi went to bat for the state and got money from banks that, that had deceitful lending practices. So there's some available there. Again, CD, uh, CDBG. Um, neighborhood stabilization funds, project rebuild. There are funds now, again, subject to sequestration, but there are funds available. This community redevelopment area that we're working on, I think is probably one of the greatest things we, we can do, not just because we'll wait 10 years to get an increment or tax increment financing, but because together, collectively, the county and the city can work together to go after these funds. And yes, while the mayor is not the superintendent of schools, Guess what? I worked closely with a new charter school that is opening next week, right there next to Enoch Davis, and we've worked together as partners to make sure that they open on time. They already have a waiting list. That's what mayors can do. Amen. The question is the strategy. Well, my strategy with respect to the school fund, because I think that really is the key, is education. That's why I think the city can play a role with preschool, preparing kids for school. We all are familiar with WIC, women's infant children funding for food, and now it's been transformed into SNAP. Again, these are food programs, and of course, everybody knows food is very important for newborn babies because the brain is developing, and that's why it's key, and that's why we support making sure that we have enough food for our children when they're growing. And then we have to look at how we're going to get them ready for school. And my strategy is to use the existing funds we have to make sure we're applying for all of them and intervening at every level of every government entity that we have and non-governmental entity, whether it's a non-profit, in order to ensure that we are accessing all the funds. There's a few funds, I'm sure you're familiar with the future the foundation. There are a lot of them out there. And I know that since the city of St. Pete has decreased its grant application staff, we have lost those opportunities. We're still getting the law enforcement grants, but we really need to look at how we can leverage more of the um, federal, state, and county dollars to bring them home here to St. Pete, because I think it's critical to move forward. And you're right, housing, I've always been involved in affordable housing initiatives here in the city of St. Pete, both as a volunteer and as a city council member. And jobs, again, education is the key to finding a job, and I want to make sure that we're attracting those sorts of companies that have different levels of jobs so that we have lots of opportunity for jobs. Thank you, Dr. Lambridge. Before I, before I talk about dollars, let me, let me mention something else that I think the city can do. And, and it stems from a story uh, that, that I was told by when I was walking neighborhoods with my son. We knocked on a gentleman's door. Uh, I said, what's the biggest issue you have facing you here in St. Pete? This was in Midtown. He said, jobs. I can't get a job. I'm a convicted felon. I'm getting my GED. I'm trying to turn my life around, but no one will hire me because I'm a convicted felon. Now, the city can put pro uh, policies in place not only for us to give, as the city to give people who have felonies an opportunity, but we can put incentives for private businesses to hire people who've got felony convictions. So we can start right there with getting people in, in jobs that are that are struggling to turn their lives around. Uh, the second thing is, I agree with Ms. Ford, we, we are not doing everything that we ought to be doing as far as getting grant dollars in. I think we have a lot of opportunities. And if you do read the paper, as Mr. Foster said, you will see that even in these difficult times, the city of Tampa, and the mayor of Tampa was able to go to Washington and bring $30 million back here uh, to his community. 
If they can do it in Tampa, there's no reason we can't do the same thing here. You just have to travel there and, and have the resources and have the relationships and know who to ask to try and bring the money home. But you've got to be willing to do it. And I'm willing to do that. We need to do that. Thank you. Before we um, go to the next question, I've been asked to acknowledge all of the candidates that are brave enough to compete for city council seats. For <laughs> District 2, Jim Kennedy and Lorraine Hardison. For District 4, Darren Rice, David McCallum, and Carolyn Fry. For District 6, Carl Nurse and Trevor Mallory. And for District 8, Amy Foster, Alex Gunsing, and Steve Galvin. Please give them a round of applause for this. Thank you. Thanks, Christian. Well, that's actually a perfect segue for a tiny public service announcement. I filmed the Tiger Bay today for the District 4 and District 8 candidates, and Nick Weathersby has filmed a bunch of the forums. They're all on YouTube. Uh, if you search for the keyword shadow vote, you can see most of mine if you want to see the candidates and the other mayoral forms. See, I've got a warning already. I haven't even started my question yet. I've got a question. Okay. Uh, part one, has anybody up there had any donations from Bank of America? No. Okay, good. This will make the rest of it easy. Um, so, Bank of America is used by the city and is a huge account because we're the fourth largest city in Florida. They've been caught, and there's been people who testified, at least in the press yet, hasn't finished the court system, but they were paying bonuses on their mortgages to anybody who could hold up the process of, to their employees for dragging their feet on mortgage refinancing until the foreclosure was complete. Completely cheating people out of their houses. I mean, blatant criminal activity, these people are as bad as the mafia. All right? And we do business with them. So, there's an RFP coming up, I believe, next year, because of the meeting this year, or last year, on whether we should renew the contract with Bank of America. So, my question is, will you speak out against that RFP? And what I would like to see personally in a mayor, and you can explain if you are this mayor, I'd like to see somebody stand up and say, because you did this, this, and this, and this, we're not going to let you come to our town, prey on our citizens, and expect you to be our customer. And read that into the record. In an upcoming meeting. Is that for all three candidates? That's for all three. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Leonard. I think that is really disgusting, the predatory lending practices and then combined with the fraud, the robo-signing, and it is stunning to me that Wall Street still has not been held accountable. And I know it takes time, but what the SEC is doing in the way of, of these deals is pretty disgusting. You know, they just had one about the whatever whale over in London, and I'm like, how does this happen? These are billions of dollars that are lost, and yet how many folks are in prison over a couple thousand. And that's what I think is just a real signal of the problems we have here in the United States of America. Yes, I would do just that. Yeah, I do think we need to look at who we do business with. Uh, I also think we ought to be giving deference to local banks uh, that are in the city of St. Petersburg and want to do business with the city of St. Petersburg. We've got local banks here who are great institutions. Uh, and it's important not only to try and keep, uh, keep business and do business with locals, but it's equally important that we have a commitment from who we're doing business with that they're going to start lending to our small businesses who are not only trying to start, but are trying to survive in this economy. And what I'm hearing on the street is it's extremely difficult to get businesses like Bank of America to loan money to small businesses, to, to help small businesses that are trying to survive Stay, stay up uh, And that's something we should be looking at also. So you would vote against them on the RFP, right? Yeah, I, I have a real problem with that, yes, sir. Well, I think every time you do an RFP, it's all competitive. It's competitively based. But guess what? It is your money. We've looked at this before, and it's not, and trust me when I say, and I know that's a loaded term, 
it's not like you're closing your bank account and opening up a bank account in your personal finances next door. We've got hundreds of millions of dollars. We've got tens of thousands of employees that have direct deposit here and, and electronic banking there. And we've got software that's full of all of this data. And there is a tremendous cost at changing banks and converting from one to another. It's not like your savings account at home. There are, there are huge constraints to that. Now, as we go forward with the RFP, is it worth looking at now? Absolutely. Council looks at that every time it comes up. The issue's been discussed, and guess what? We'll talk about it again, but there's a lot of man hour, woman hour time involved in that, and it would take months to effectuate such a transaction like that. That's the reality. We should start now. Thanks. <laughs> right. Good evening, everybody. My name is Corey Gibbons, Jr. Uh, my question is addressed to all three candidates. You know, with all due respect, Mr. Mayor, we open up the Saint, well, the Tampa Bay Times now every day, and there's two issues with City Hall that just keep popping up. One is there's too many people in City Hall that are all about the politics and not about the business. And two, transparency, this little old thing that we used to call accountability, you know. Uh, so my question for you is, as mayor, your job is to first and foremost be a businessman and to attract business here to St. Petersburg. We see businesses like Universal leaving our city every day, jobs leaving our city. Yes, we have those table scrap jobs like retail and restaurants, but what type of bacon will you bring to the table? What type of high paying jobs will you lure to the city of St. Petersburg? That's a great question. I think we're doing that now. I think the biggest opportunity that we have right now is along this medical corridor. And on the next city council meeting, we're going to propose, I propose that the city council approve a land swap with all children's Johns Hopkins. Because I think in this medical corridor, again, when you have Johns Hopkins associated with all children's, you have HMA Bayfront associated with UF Shams, you have USF Health, when you're looking at academics, research, development, patient care, this medical corridor is going to explode in a very positive way. And you will see a spinoff of high paying jobs going into this. Cluster development in the marine sciences. They're not going to stop drilling in the Gulf of Mexico as much as we beat our chest. Guess what? They're still going to do it. But we've got this marine science laboratory with USF right here in a port that could get out there with two research vessels. And we're trying to get more. So when you look at marine science and this, this the, you know, protection of the fisheries and, and all, this concentration of marine scientists, those will create high bank jobs. Banking, insurance, and financing. When you look at all of these things, all of this new development happening in the city, it's going to create new bank jobs. If we, if we can relocate businesses, yes, that's a good thing. But to also focus on small business. And with this green, the greenhouse that we created, it says stop. But we've got some exciting momentum for small business in the city of St. Pete. Corey, every time I open the paper, I feel like I'm reading somewhere that uh, Mayor Buckhorn is traveling to try and bring business back to this community. Uh, so we see him out uh, doing everything he can to be the head cheerleader and, and bring business back in. And you know, we talk about green science, and we do have tremendous opportunities when it comes to green science between. USF, St. Pete, and Eckerd College. And we don't want to forget about Eckerd College because they're doing some great things there. But when you talk to their professors at, at USF, they say no one from the city is talking to them. They say that we have an opportunity with our port, which is unused, for it to become the research hub for the entire Gulf of Mexico. We do have an opportunity when it comes to health sciences with all children at Johns Hopkins. And I'd be spending time in Maryland sitting down with the folks from Johns Hopkins and saying, we need you to expand your footprint here because we want your business here. And lastly, the other thing we ought to be focusing on is we've got the dome industrial area, and we've done a great job putting the land together. But we're turning businesses away. We've got a, a business that's on Beach Drive that came here, Magna, electric bicycles. They wanted to open manufacturing here, and working with the city, they ran into problems. They took their manufacturing, they opened their plant in Europe. That shouldn't happen. We've got the dome industrial area. Why aren't we using it? 
we have opportunities for battery technology, LED technology, solar technology. We should be attracting those businesses which are high tech, high wage jobs. You all have heard me say it earlier this evening, and that is that education is going to be key to attracting new business to the city of St. Petersburg. And as someone who has actually worked in a medical center, at the Texas Medical Center in Houston, Texas, which has a collaboration between several different universities, including Baylor College of Medicine and the University of Texas Health Sciences Center, and I had a, my particular position was funded through a federal grant as the Infertility Nurse Coordinator. I can tell you that when you have a strong medical center, you can employ a lot of folks at a lot of different levels. And it's a shame that we kind of gave away our asset to HMA, and they immediately flipped it to somebody else. I'm very much concerned about that particular move because I think we do need to grow our adult care. We've got a lot of new things coming on at St. Anthony's. I do like the relationship that it's growing between you have chance but that's a little bit further away. And I think we really need to tend to that because our adult care, frankly, does not meet the same level as our pediatric care here in Dallas County. We've got to grow that. We've got to grow and diversify our economy. We've got Raymond James Financial that really employs a lot of folks here in Pinellas County. We need to go out and grow that business, those opportunities with that particular business. Additionally, let's look at how we can incubate new entrepreneurs so that they can grow their business here in St. Pete. Lots of smaller businesses to hire. Thank you. Um, I'm also acting as an unofficial timekeeper, and I know that Pastor Sykes uh, welcomed us graciously, but we want to be obedient and, and be out of here at the allocated time that he has allowed for us on versus four. So I'm looking that we have five additional questions with three candidates at approximately two minutes apiece, which means we have another 30 minutes before we can actually ask our questions, wrap up, clean up, get our straw holes, and be gone. And as Pastor Sykes would graciously say, you do not have to go home. What you got to So we're going to ask this permission if we can go over, and I'm going to ask that the last five questions. Please state clearly if you're asking questions of all three candidates because that also dictates the amount of time that remains. Thank you. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Crane and I have a question for all three candidates. Um, founders in this country such as Henry Ford came up with businesses um, that ran like clockwork and you may ask him a question, him about it, and he would say certainly I can find somebody that can answer that for you. Or you can Fast forward to Elon Musk, and you ask him how his car runs, and he can probably tell you. Now, the 2020 plan I would like to know is how are you all going to see to it that the plan actually works? So much of the plan is, is really based on funding. Can't implement uh, the pieces without having the resources to do that. And I know we, we've talked a little bit about that uh, before. We need to look at you know, uh, excess reserves, whether it's uh, in the GR or it's in enterprise funding. We need to look at uh, grants, and public private partnerships to bring in resources into the community. Uh, it's about going to Tallahassee and uh, helping our elected officials uh, get money in the budget bring back home here, uh, going up to Washington and doing the same thing. Uh, if we don't have the resources, if we don't start investing that the money uh, in, then none of the ideas that are within the plan are going to get accomplished. Uh, and really, that is the biggest challenge that we all face. I am committed to doing that. I'm certainly not afraid to go up to Tallahassee and Washington and try and reach out to our business community and get them to partner in with us on it, because it benefits them too. When this community as a whole is growing. When this community is succeeding, uh, the business community succeeds too. Uh, if people have money, they have money, and they have money they can spend in those businesses. So we need to we need to get the business community involved and bought into this plan also. I think that's really important.
looking at the 10 items that are listed as the parts of the 2020 plan, of course, the important thing to do is to begin with prioritizing and then understanding what bits and pieces can we pull out and start working on today and then come up with our strategy for how we're going to do them in the future. And I think an important part of it is going to be continual evaluation because times, conditions, And so I think, how are we doing? Um, but I am committed to addressing the problems of poverty, especially in this particular CRA area. And I understand that we have to leverage all the resources that are available at all the different levels, not just government resources, but those other non-governmental entities, the charitable organizations. And again, that's why I think we need to have staff in the city who are really good at applying for those grants because it does make a difference and you are able, able to leverage much more. The other thing is understanding and identifying folks who have the experience with implementing these sorts of programs and strategies. And it's going to take all of us. We can't just show up every four years where there's an election cycle and say, we want A, B, C, D, E and then wait four years. Oh, now we want C, D, E, F, G. We've got to continually evaluate, continually meet. And I think regularly meeting and having some clear goals, as are stated here, will be helpful. But I want to know how these goals fit in with the overall picture. And that's where I'm trying to match up what I see in the poverty study and understand that this will have that impact on poverty. One of the things I learned tonight about Mr. Chrysler is he sure does like to travel. And, and I don't know that really, you know, we've had really good success with grants. And, I mean, I didn't have to travel. Now, granted, I went to Tallahassee to work with USF St. Pete to get $5 million for their school of business. And I had to work on a weekend to lobby the governor hard all weekend to make sure that there wasn't a veto. But, you know, we've had pretty good success. When you have a relationship with legislators, and their legislators that actually accomplish things when they get to Tallahassee and Washington, yeah, you don't have to go there. They already know what your needs are. And, and so, yeah, we've had some pretty good success. Mayor Buckhorn got $30 million in some grants because his poverty study and his white study was significantly worse than ours. It's all numbers driven. Now, the most important component to Agenda 2020 is sitting in this room. It's you. Government will not fix everything. We need you. It's, it's bigger than just putting money. It's that erosion problem. It's making sure that we take care of families. But it's, it's making sure that through partnerships, through incentives, through, through joint efforts, we get these monies from Washington, from the state. And as joint efforts, we implement this, this war on poverty. And that collectively with this idea of the community, community redevelopment plan, that you are writing with me at the table. This is how we're going to implement Agenda 2020. And I'm passionate about it. I never left the table. Thank you. Thank you. We have just been given a new rule. Uh, out of respect for your questions, and it would be so honored that we have the candidates here with us tonight. What we're asking, because we do have uh, additional questions that need to be asked or like to be asked, we're going to see how obedient our candidates are to see if we can narrow their responses down to one minute. Do you think they can do that? Yes. 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 Okay, so we're going to see how obedient they are to see if we can take additional questions. So we do have a new rule, and we thank everyone. I should be able to help them with that because my pleading is going to take longer than the answer to the question should be. Um, my name is Paula Woodhouse. I'm a 50-year resident of St. Petersburg. Uh, I came here when I was four years old. I grew up on the south side. I went to Rose Park Elementary. I went to South Side Junior High School. I went to Bogusia for one year. Yay! Um, the whole point is, um, I'm not a woman of color, but I'm an intelligent woman who knows that, that we have serious issues, not just in this town, but across our country. And our president has given us points with which to deal with these. Now, having said that, 
The only reason I'm speaking tonight, I was going to relax because it's actually a night off from working the candidate forums that I have been working. Um, Mayor Foster, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree with you. And I'm going to, I would really like to see a study done on this, but I believe that there isn't always a victim that calls and the police come and find someone and arrest them for a crime. I think there's a lot of arbitrary seeking of people that just look like they're up to no good. And there's a lot of racial profiling still happening here. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that means that the New York Supreme Court has decided that it's really impossible for a police officer to look at a white guy and look at a black guy and decide which one's up to no good. So they are throwing out the stop and frisk law. My question to you, as my mayor, whether or not we don't have one of those, we know it happens. I want to know if A, you're going to stop the stop and frisk policies and the racial profiling, and B, when the officers that do not comply with that will be held accountable. All three of them. Okay. All three? All three, sorry. Assuming that you're correct, the Supreme Court has thrown out. No, New York State. State Supreme, New York State Supreme, not our Supreme Court. Okay, okay. I have a chief of police, and I have the utmost confidence in him and his ability to manage public safety in the city of St. Petersburg. And contrary to anyone's popular belief, I don't micromanage the police department. If the stop and frisk is indeed a policy, and is being abused, I will absolutely see to its termination. And if it's, and if any one of our police officers violates a policy in the St. Petersburg Police Department, a department that has grown with courtesy, respect, integrity, they will be disciplined, they will be dealt with accordingly. I think we've got plenty of evidence of that. When policies are broken, the discipline absolutely follows. So, Hopefully I've answered. Well, no, because what I asked was, will you help to put an end to the racial profiling as mayor of the city? Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, I would uh, put an end to racial profiling. And I also would uh, take a, another look at our chase policy. I think we've got serious problems with that. And even taking it a step further, uh, I don't know if you call it a non-chase policy, but we have an issue where we have, at times, officers who are just driving down the street at high rates of speed when there's no crime going on. Uh, and that's got to stop too because it's pushing our kids at risk. Um, the other thing that I think we need to take a look at, uh, and I thank uh, Pastor Sykes for, for leading the charge on this issue, is, is looking at some cultural training. Um, and so that we have officers who come from various backgrounds that have sensitivities to the various backgrounds that exist within our community. The other issue is that there is a problem right now. It is unfair, unequal law enforcement. And a friend of mine witnessed a police cruiser going through her neighborhood. No flashing lights, no siren. It's at night and there weren't even any headlights on. And so that is a part of an internal affairs investigation, I believe, right now. It is happening, and I know Mr. Newton has told me that's happened before. He's heard of it. In this particular instance, instance, there are a couple of statements now and a description. So that cannot be tolerated. We already know that we have a problem, and we know we have to address that. So I'm absolutely committed to making sure it's Thank you. Hello, my name is Michelle. I'm a student at USF St. Pete. Um, my question for you, all three, um, as mayor, how would you improve access to healthy, affordable food for the residents of St. Petersburg? I love urban gardens. Uh, actually, and I'm not saying that really in fun because I think part of the issue that we have to look at is having more locally grown food. I am concerned about the gen genetically modified seeds that Monsanto is producing and everything else that's going on in our grocery stores along times for transporting fruits and vegetables across not just state lines but country lines and, and I think we really have to look at 
having more locally grown fruits and vegetables, and I think putting into place whatever ordinances are necessary to encourage that would be helpful. You know it's a business, and a grocer is entitled to charge whatever the market will bear. We are a free market system. To the extent that we can make it more affordable for our downtown businesses to operate, because there are higher costs, then I would be in favor of adjusting, for example, bus schedules so that more customers can come by. And that, I think, could potentially be something that can be used with whatever grocery store goes into Cold Sweet Thank you for the question, Michelle. And uh, you have somebody right behind you, actually, almost. Who's uh, an incredible champion uh, on this issue. Uh, Penny has been really leading the charge when it comes to uh, community gardens. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, I'd love to see happening uh, with greater frequency around the city, along with farmers markets. But we also want to be looking at co-ops. And I know the People's Budget Review is one of the things that they've talked about is the power of co-ops where people are, are invested in the success uh, of that of that store and, and you don't have some you don't have at risk like you had in Sweet uh, when you have co-ops. Uh, you've got people who are really looking out for the community because they own what's happening there. So I think there's some things that we can do uh, and I'm really excited about the opportunity to, to really uh, grow uh, that initial sense of Excited. It really is an urban garden because uh, I got to tell you, I'm not a mayor that thinks we, we should legislate diet. I'm not going to legislate the size of your your big gulps or your slurpees, and I'm not going to tell you you can't go to McDonald's. And you know, you're you're all grown ups, and you're kind of accountable for the decisions that you make. But access to healthy, affordable food is really in the urban gardening concept. And I I've, I've been working with the school system, and I'm hoping we can get a part of that Riviera Middle School property that they tore down on 62nd, because it's it's huge acreage. Why can't we allow people to farm that? I am a huge supporter of the urban gardens. We can, and as I've said, we can provide the reclaimed water if it's suitable, or the mulch, all the mulch you can use and things like that, because I think that is a, a tremendous resource and it really brings people together. But that's the access. I mean, it's kind of my program, I'm thinking, you know, it's the dig program. Dirt is gold, and it really is. So I think that gives people access to help the affordable. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Jeff Coleman. Uh, just to kind of reiterate. Uh, oh. That's <laughs> 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 right, Reverend Coleman's son. All right. I want to reiterate something uh, that was just said a few months ago uh, about the, uh, the ability and trust you have in your police chief. And like the police chief said in the newspaper that uh, he was against even bothering the chase policy, but unfortunately, because you were the mayor, he had to go ahead and do what you said do. So in having the ability to have courage and stand behind the police chief, if he's that great of a police chief, then why would not follow what he's asking of us? Now that's the first question. And that's to you, Mr. Mayor. The other question is to all three candidates. You guys are here because you want us to support you for mayor. You also want us to go out in the community and tell all our friends which one of you three we're going to support the mayor. What I want to know is, for our community, what are you going to do and who did you support in the last presidential election? One thing I want to make clear as far as the pursuit of voters, because there's been a lot of things talked about tonight about the pursuit of voters. The pursuit policy for the city of St. Petersburg is identical to just about every other law enforcement agency in Pinellas County. Pinellas County Sheriff, Hillsborough, City of Tampa. Doesn't make it right. These are, it, it completely follows and tracks state law and allows the ability based upon risk factors to pursue forcible felonies. And if you look at that list of what is a forcible felon, these are pretty bad people. Now, you always weigh the risk. I wouldn't pursue somebody suspected of, of, of murder during, you know, when, when the risk factors are high during, you know, 3 o'clock down 20 seconds when one of the schools is letting out and things like that. So you always weigh the risk factors 
and you can terminate them. It simply gives the officer the ability to pursue, but then once the risk factors are assessed and it has to be approved by a supervisor, they must terminate. But it's all about risk factors, but this pursuit policy absolutely mirrors state law and just about every other law enforcement agency in the state of Florida. Last question. Just to answer the last question, because uh, you just have the mayor, so you can't control the chase policy. No, you're, you're right. I won't. Not yet. Uh, I will be on that. Uh, <laughs> 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 it has to do with how the policy is implemented. And just like the, it, 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 there was another article about the, uh, about the community policing, and uh, she said it, it didn't work. Well, it's, it's how it's implemented. Because it's working in a lot of other communities around the country. Uh, in answer to your last question, um, I voted for and supported uh, our President Barack Obama, and I also was the first elected official in 2007 in St. Petersburg to endorse him. You all may recall the last time I ran that I was opposed to the Chase policy, and this is precisely why. We've seen more property damage and personal injury as a result of this. And I don't think anybody's life is worth a stolen purse. I don't think, I just don't think that's why. Now, I've been working since 2000 in Bush v. Gore debacle on addressing voter suppression. And I have been working with a group of statewide attorneys to look at what's going on, what, what the legislature is doing in order to ensure access to the polls. And so I have been at precincts doing poll watching and canvassing boards to ensure that you have the right to vote. I supported Barack Obama and I was at the precinct from 6.30 in the morning till 8.30 in the evening, making sure that those votes were all tabulated and reported correctly. I think it's important to be standing by you on that. Thank you, Wendy. Well, obviously, when it comes to uh, 
closing the health gap, uh, and, and what we eat uh, has a big impact on it. Um, you know, when you've got kids who are eating healthy foods, uh, naturally grown foods, uh, you have all kinds of risks from childhood diabetes uh, to other uh, obesity issues, and it all has long-term negative implications on, on these kids. And it also impacts the brain. Uh, we can't forget about that, that when you're not eating healthy, you're not getting uh, good sleep, and, and, and it, it impacts your brain. So having uh, community gardens, having opportunities to eat things other than, this is not a slam on McDonald's or fast food, but things other than fast food has a big impact. Um, education, we have talked about education, and, and that's critical. I mean, if we don't start making changes, if St. Petersburg schools continue to be the worst in Pinellas County, nothing's going to change. Kids aren't going to have hope, and the direction they're going to go is we're going to start spending more and more money again on fighting crime and on incarceration. So we have to make changes in those areas.
you know as a principal, you can always implement policy that's, right. that's more restrictive than what state law. Okay. Second fact, all forcible felonies are violent felonies. And we've always for years said that if we could not justify shooting an individual, it didn't make sense to chase them throughout the streets and risk the police officer's life and some people's lives and what have you. We had a model policy in terms of pursuits. People were going to court and hold our policy up as the one. When I say people, I'm talking about these hired guns that would go in to sue. This is the policy that you should, should follow. We have case law read in this district that speaks to pursuits and what we should do. So I just want to clarify for all these people that I supported the mayor in the last election. And in my support of him, I basically talked to him until I was blue in the face about not amending the policy. His current chief said that he said the same thing, but unfortunately, Mayor, you bowed to the union and you did it. It's a bad policy. We need to go back to when we were innovative, creative, and doing what we needed to do. Thank you. We have one more question. Oh, two more. Okay. And we are going to be obedient. I've always told obedience since all, all the way better than sacrifice. So we're not going to go no more than three minutes over our allotted time. Thank you. Dr. Kevin Gordon, and my question is about it related to education. We've all heard you talk about this evening how important education is. Uh, so I'm going to preface my question first with some data so you can give us some informed answers. Uh, we know from some historical reports that nationally we have been the poorest in the country in educating black students. And some of the most recent data indicate that we haven't improved in that area. In fact, if you compare us to other districts like Broward, Hillsborough, and Dade, we're at the bottom and continuing to trend down. So instead of telling us about how important you think it is for early education, how about St. Pete Promise, and that's great. What I want to hear about is at the end of the day, how are we going to hold the school district accountable? How are you, what metrics are you going to put in place so that we move our students forward? Right now we're saying we're going to do this and we're going to do that, but we have had absolutely no conversation about when we're going to go back to the table and address why our students are not making any gains at all and in fact are regressing. So I want to know how we're going to hold the school districts accountable for moving our students forward so that we can have economic development, so that we can create jobs for our children. You don't have to go to Washington or Tallahassee to have to pay for your kids. And I intend to have a, a personal voice as I work with Dr. Michael Grego, as I work with Ryan Powers, as I work with this school board to make sure that we get the resources that we need, whether it's money, whether it's it's teachers, whether it's incentives for teachers going into to low performing schools, the metrics that we use will be achievement gap, you know, closing the achievement gap, it'll be school performance, and as long as we have to live within this FCAP system, we're gonna have to perform within that system, but it's to increase the grades of our schools. Increase the grades of our student, making sure that those that are college bound can actually get into college, make sure that, that we assess those that are vocational bound can get into a P-TECH, a St. Pete College, and the partnerships that we have. But it's making sure that we hold those responsible accountable. And it is all, all about relationships. But you know, we're gonna have these metrics, we're gonna we're gonna study this to make sure that yes, yeah, St. Pete Promise has to work. We have to do doorway scholarships, we have to have mentors. But when I was talking to the Gibbs High School um, teachers before they're going in at Melrose Elementary, it's to make sure that the teachers are equipped with the resources that they need to educate your kids. That's right. First off, one of the, oh, nice yeah. one of the first things we need to do is we, we need to stop demonizing teachers. Uh, teachers aren't good at going to the whole school problem. Uh, and you do have to go to Tallahassee to, to try and change policy uh, because what we see coming down from Tallahassee is it's a redistribution of funding. Uh, we see changes in, in taking away teachers' ability to be creative. 
We also see because of the lack of funding, uh, teachers that are having to do more in the classroom that it isn't teaching. Uh, spending time as hall monitors, spending time as cafeteria monitors instead of teaching. So that's one of the things that we need to do. We also need to work, and we have opportunities to work with our local unions on apprenticeship programs uh, and alternative career programs so that kids that, that aren't uh, headed toward college have a career where they can earn a good wage, a good living, and, and be proud of what they're doing. And uh, so there's some real opportunities we need to take advantage of.
was working to improve our neighborhoods. And based on my experience with North Shore and developing the very first neighborhood association, I was asked by Charles Payne and Tom Tito, come on over here to Barbara Park and help us develop a neighborhood association. From there, then, I was asked to participate in the City's Coast Compliance Task Force. And we would meet in our Davis and develop those plans that we thought would work the best for the City of St. Pete to bring up our housing stock. At that point in time, in the late 80s and early 90s, we realized that our housing was slipping. So from there, I was asked to sit on the housing roundtable and look at how we spend our CDPG funds and our SHIP funds in order to make sure we have affordable housing. Of course, St. Pete Proud I was a participant on. And more recently, I've been sitting on the Friends of James Wells and Johnson Library branch in order to help with the literacy efforts there because I do think reading is important and I think kids are important. Thank you. During my entire time on council, um, I supported every initiative and worked with the mayor on every initiative to uh, improve and bring businesses here to the town area to sell some beers. When I left council and went to the state legislature, I fought for voter rights and to expand voter rights so that people had access to the polls. I fought for money to go for affordable housing. I fought for money to go into public education and to try and strengthen our public education and refocus on uh, strengthening our schools globally. Uh, so, and, and fought against bills that would uh, hurt our local community and prevent us from, from trying to make the changes and, and quite frankly, from trying to felonize everything. There was a real effort underway to try and make everything a felony. Uh, so that's where I spent my, my efforts. And also, lastly, to be the voice for the community uh, up in Tallahassee, uh, and speaking from the minority. Well, I too on the city council supported those initiatives, everything from the Mercy Hospital redo to the Tangerine redevelopment to Job Corps to uh, Dome Industrial. All of these things, revival of Jordan Elementary and the, the historic designation there. But to take it a step further as mayor, oh, and, and yes, we did start the community law fest. But as mayor, when you look at the revival of Discover the Deuces, Deuces Live, when you look at the Manhattan Casino with this destination restaurant called Sylvia's actually going in, when you look at this, you know, some of these, 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 blight removal and, and Paris projects going on throughout the community. When you look at a St. Pete College committed to a 45,000 square foot building and helping to, to negotiate that lease. When sitting down with you in Agenda 2020 working on this community development agency, I don't just come out every four years or, 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 or come in and out of, the, of, of the, the parts of the city of St. Petersburg that are important. I'm here all the time. Thank you so much. Before I bring Mr. Warren up, who will close out the program, I want to thank you for allowing me to moderate this event. And I must say that you all did such a wonderful job. You behaved and have to applaud yourself. Thank you so much. I hope that uh, before, uh, when you arrived, some of the questions that you had were answered. And that this form actually served as a viable platform for you in helping you make a, an, an intelligent decision in our next mayoral race. Thank you again. So to close out the program, and I must also remind you, make sure you have your voter guide. Please take one with you. I'm going to bring up Brother Warren again to close out the forum. Thank you and have a great evening. Please give a little round of applause for our people. The result of our struggle will be published in the Weekly Challenger as well as Power Broker Magazine. We are also going to petition uh, the St. Petersburg Times to publish those results as well. So please make sure that you keep an eye out to make sure that your vote tonight was counted to find out the results of uh, how you really thought about these candidates this evening. Uh, at this point, we want to close out. Yeah, make sure you see this young man right here. If you still have your strong old votes, we can get a, a perfect tally. Uh, we can bring up Pastor Sykes one more time just to close us out uh, and have the final word here so we can send everybody off as blessed as they can. <laughs> Thanks to the candidates, to the mayor, to all of you who made this night possible. We are grateful once again for our kitchen staff who really I think a wonderful job. We want to thank you for the food that you had. 
they provide the funding for it. And we hope y'all got to know the person next to you. We're pretty close here tonight. I want to also say that it's very important that you hold it back. No matter what you hear, no matter what you say, it will go unnoticed if you do not hold it. The other thing I want to say is this. Agenda 2010, along with the people budget, have come together and worked very hard to develop what could be a total revitalization of the South Side and a final leveling of the playing field. We need you to push every candidate to do more than give lip service, put the money in the community. Our community has, for the time I've been here for 25 years, the line has been very clear in terms of when we cross certain streets where economics and all the other improvements in it. The time has come when that needs to stop. We don't have to go back to a think tank. The plan is in place. All we need to do is fund it and support it. Also, Thursday night at 6 p.m., September 12th, the People's Budget will be meeting again and they're asking all residents to come. Keep giving your input and feedback so this can truly be a community effort. With that being said, shall we pray? We're grateful once again for allowing us tonight to come together to hear the plans and the promises and the the future that each of these candidates envision for this community. We ask now, God, that your people will hear keenly and understand clearly, and that what they do with their vote will make the right vision come to fruition. We ask that we will not be apathetic, frustrated, or doubtful that we will make every effort to let our voices be heard. Bless each of us now, whatever our faith persuasion may be, to continue to let you guide our steps to the light now ahead. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.